Dodgers After Dark, uh, welcome back uh, to enlightening and informative uh, conversation with young alumni of historically black colleges and universities. Brought to you by the HBCU Digest. I'm your host, Jared Carter. Uh, joined, by, joined by frat brother Eric. Tiff about to be thrown off the show. Uh, Laurel the Aggie. Uh, Ors the Morganite. Uh, Una the Hamptonian. Taylor the Hamptonian. And uh, Lion brother KD. Uh, first Yo. time broadcasting live on the Clubhouse app. Want to thank everybody who's pinging in, tapping in with us in the new year. Also got Winston getting him into school uh, via StreamYard. <laughs> 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 waiting to get him. <laughs> waiting to get him team. <laughs> on team apple uh but always glad to hear it so we want to open up the conversation like this as we do every single episode we are going to have a couple rounds of conversation on different topics and at around 8 40 we're going to invite folks up who've been listening to the audience to participate and ask some questions give some feedback want to open up uh with a conversation about yesterday and while that isn't you know the the, the most hbcu centric thing that we could do um, I think it is necessary to get into a conversation about that. And we're going to go in order, starting with Fred. Um, just your thoughts, you know, get you about 90 seconds to rock on what, what you saw, what you feel. Um, and obviously, you know, what how do you think the country moves forward, particularly from a black perspective? Eric? You know, this was possibly the weirdest thing that I've ever seen. And that's the best way that I could put it. And. You just get to a place where you're just like, and it's going to sound really bad, but it's very facetious. It's like, you know, with all the white on white crime we saw take place yesterday between the protesters, I mean, rioters and the police officers, I, I feel as though that's something that that community should deal with. Um, but overall, I mean, as far as us all moving forward, I mean, what, what can we do right now? Right. Uh, hopefully we will see a change, but I, I just fear the fact of uh Yesterday was essentially like a call to arms for people who already were feeling the same way as those those rioters, um, and it, I don't necessarily think that they're going to that they're going to decrease the numbers. I think they're just going to now swell. That's the quickest way I can say it. Tiff, do you think it's a situation because people are 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 legitimately saying like this is the moment where Trump could be thrown out? Obviously, with what twelve days left. Um, one do you think that's legitimate two do you think that's necessary three what message do you think it sends to folks particularly in light because a lot of the talking point around this is if this were black folks trying to run up in the capitol which is surprising me that, that, that a lot of folks are taking the time to make a talking point if this were people of color this would have been a totally different situation but what do you think about the process of actually fixing it and making it different um it's been unsurprising to see people who are privileged, who are white, um, be shocked or try to recover ground and resign and say, oh, this is not America. And it's like, <laughs> it is. So for me, I'm just like, you can say, you can do things to say, this is not, I don't hold these feelings. They were on their own. These are these these are people who don't represent us, but it's like they do and they have and they've been signaled by your president. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just. What can you fix? Like we told y'all we've been saying this isn't right, but media has propelled this man. These social media platforms that are icing him now. I mean, where was this energy six years ago? It's too late. <laughs> like this has to play out how it's playing out. Hate to say it, but there's white people and their problems right now, to be quite honest. Um, so that's that's one thing. Another thing is, um, I was just like, even though I could, I I expect this to happen, or I'm not surprised by it. I was really annoyed that I was watching these people up in this building, the, this Capitol building, and outside and on the grounds. And just they didn't they didn't have any masks on. Like you're not even concerned about your own health. You're not even concerned about not getting caught after this. Partly, I think, because you don't care. You don't think anything's gonna come of it because you're never held accountable. But y'all really are out here being super spreaders because you're mad. Like, <laughs> and so I'm like, the only the only other time that I've seen a group of white people behave in this manner is when their team has lost. And so I'm like, dang. They really are consistent with it. Is that what y'all do in Detroit? Do y'all run up in the state capitol? 
First of all, the whoa, only whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that run up in my state capital in Lansing are the people who are Trump supporters. Thank you very much. Detroiters, real Detroiters. Um, I hate to say it, but some people don't leave the zip code. Some people do not leave um, the confines of of, um, of the city. Don't cross the city limits. Don't cross eight mile or whatever. So, like, it's not Detroiters who are going and seeking out these these things. It's it's other people who don't have to worry about what happens when they cross eight mile. So, why are you trying to make jokes? I'm a PTR. Keep playing with me. <laughs> Laura, what what are your thoughts on this? You you've had strong uh, reaction on on social media, like the, like the rest of us. Um, it, it, I guess from a historical perspective, uh, do you, does it does it feel like this is a changing moment? Does it feel like it's just sad and it'll sit here and it won't be a catalyst for anything? Like, how do you look at it from a historical perspective? I mean, beyond the fact that black people literally literally built the capital and. To see just, I mean, like people were saying it yesterday that, you know, this, the the sad part is that this actually might be the tipping point to actually make D.C. a state. Because for the longest, you know, as a, when it used to actually be Chocolate City, you know, there was always this issue about taxation before representation and all these other things. And the rest of the country automatically assumes that, oh, the only thing in D.C. is just politics. And it's like, no, people actually live here. And I think what pissed me off the most is that even just from city leadership, not even just Trump's administration, city leadership failed big time because a lot of the precautions that should have been taken, even if you didn't think that was going to be the outcome of yesterday, you are a fool if you thought that, oh, well, they're just going to come here and they're just going to, you know, be out here with tiki torches again. No, you should have known it was always leading here. And truthfully, I thought what happened yesterday was going to happen on the 20th, but, t- but worse. So I just think, you know, a lot of the white people were shocked somehow. And it's like, you just haven't, you know, you shouldn't be shocked because you know, you just didn't care. But now you have no choice but to care because now it's at their doorstep. So I don't know, you know, of course, I think I think the answer is not so much. Is it going to change? It's like in what ways is it going to change? And is it going to change in a way that people are actually going to accept on on both sides or all sides? I'll say because it's more than just two sides. Or as you live in in uh, red country, um, what's the reaction down in Texas, Uh, particularly because you you had a, a state senator from there who even after all of this was endorsing. Uh, a lot of the rhetoric and the language that that got the people started in the first place. So I think you have a unique perspective on living around folks who actually kind of endorsed this or looked at it in a different way. D- d- do you feel like temperatures have gone down even in a place like that? So I would say I live in the blue bubble that is Houston and the Red Sea. But um, and it's funny because Ted Cruz would say he's TSU's own. He actually has visited TSU quite a bit here in Houston. Um, I, I think that people who are more moderate to, to progressive or liberal, whatever term you want to use, are, are appalled. I think some of the more hardline conservative people who live in the Houston suburbs are, are quite fine with it. I think that the, the, the biggest thing that I took away from it living down here is that Texas is a state with a lot of guns. Like, we don't have home invasions and carjackings to a large degree in this area because people have guns. You can legally, without a permit or a license, have a gun in your car, in your house, pretty much anywhere except for on your person without a license. And getting the license down here is not extremely difficult as someone who's about to get his license in a couple weeks. So I would say that that was probably the biggest thing that I noticed was just that I think people in Texas are kind of like that would never happen somewhere down here because you really going to get shot Um, versus at home or my hometown. I I was kind of echoing Laurel's point. I was more appalled that the city was so lenient. Um, I think many of us, I know Eric is from D.C. as is Laurel, you know, growing up, going to those different monuments and and, and Capitol buildings and museums. The security is, is extremely high. I remember I visited the White House pre 9-11 and it was still extremely high. So I think that 
there's been, like she said, a, a derelict of duty in, in that regard, but also um, I think that people around the country in a place like this look at it like what really happens in, in Washington. And they use the, the word Washington. I specifically use D.C. to make it sound different because um, what happened was on federal land. Um, it's a federal response. And I'm ashamed that it now becomes a reflection of what life in D.C. is like. I think most people who are who are natives um, understand that uh, there's kind of a duality in how we view things. And so I looked at yesterday like these are some crazy white people on another side of town. But the world looks at it like D.C. isn't safe for white people or for black people now. And that's kind of a, a, a weird a weird place to be. Well, now I've been particularly interested in your your perspective because you're you're active in protests. Um, all over the country. So what what did you think about this as somebody who is regularly lighting trash cans on fire, um, <laughs> taking selfies uh, around people who aren't wearing masks? <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> what did you think about it as somebody who actively participates in movements like this? Well, like Laura has said, the fact that it happened so far, well, she thought it was going to happen closer to um, the inauguration day, I thought it was going to happen closest to election, but I guess because they counted so many times to lose over and over again, they couldn't. They weren't sure if they were actual losers. Um, it It's a lot to look at something that I know, like when, when we held up the Brooklyn Bridge a couple of months ago, we couldn't, like we had fear crossing the bridge and coming back. I thought we were going to get arrested, but it was something that needed to be done. They had no fear. Y'all seen Elizabeth from Knoxville? No fear. I understand that. So it's irritating to know that the same things that I'm doing because people like me that look like me are dying, they're doing simply because they're not getting their way. It's wild irritating. Katie, um, I mean... We always have, I say we, we have the benefit of living in a, in a majority black city. Right. So a lot of this stuff we see, we, we, we can't relate, um, at least to, you know, some of the actions that some people take and the liberties they, they get to enjoy. Do you think that this will cause brothers and sisters, particularly in a protest moment to say, oh, they can get away with that. Maybe we should try to test the limits more than we do. Or do you think that it will be, you know what, we can get shot in the face. Let's continue to do <laughs> the most without doing the most dangerous. I think it's fascinating that we're having that discussion because as a as a black man from Baltimore City, we know full well what would happen if, you know, a thousand of us approached DC with weapons and flags that said Black Lives Matter. We saw the images. They were in tactical de- um tactical gear with tanks on the ground, right? So I, I think we know the answer to that question. If we approach the Capitol, they're shooting us. They were shooting us, I mean, granted, with um, non-lethal rounds, but they were shooting us just for saying Black Lives Matter. So I think we know exactly what will happen. I think the more fascinating thing for me is, like, I echo the sentiments that everybody else has said in the part that, like, we all knew this was coming. Here's the trippy part. We knew it was coming long before we knew it was coming. Uh, the FBI recognized like maybe in 2016 that um, white nationalism is the biggest terrorist group in the country and they did nothing. They could have stamped this out five years ago. We know that they were playing this on the internet and all of the fringe groups on Facebook and Twitter and 4chan and all the other different sites where conservatives go when they feel like liberals are um, being bullies, right? And they were planning it there, stoked by not just the president of the United States, but other representatives currently elected in congress so we we knew and it still happened and they did nothing to prepare for it i think that is the more fascinating thing that white people don't think that there's a problem until the results of the problem happen right and for the record didn't trump telegraph his entire presidency he just projected it on somebody else but then he didn't he like project his entire presidency when the loot starts like, almost the on script. Starts. <laughs> like almost on script he and his entire presidency there's a tweet for everything right yep including this so i think that's just the more fascinating part that white people don't believe things are an issue and so they become an issue taylor you you grew up in or you're, you're a native of st louis you've seen um 
you know, outrage at a grassroots level. And I'm just wondering on your perspective, when you see black folks taking to the streets and, and, and outrage over the killing, um, the unjust killing of a brother, and then white folks take to the streets because an election they believe to be stolen. What, what is it, what does it mean to you for, to have seen, you know, firsthand participated in what, you know, a righteous protest versus something that just seems to be built on false pretenses? Yeah. Um, I even made a tweet about it, um, yesterday. It's wild because my brain actually was, has been trying to wipe yesterday away because yesterday was very triggering for me as, um, an active protester and activist back home on the ground with everything um, in St. Louis. I tweeted about like, I've been tear gassed before I've been out on the streets. um, Rubber bullets shot at me. um, The lights turned off and then tanks are staring me at my face. And I knew I would have been dead on site, even if I even spat on the grass of the Capitol. And so yesterday triggered more so how, Many of us, when we were out there, many of us who still protest, we sometimes reconcile with the fact that we might die. We might be killed out there. And honestly, it was really hard because as I watched for a little bit, because protecting my mental space was very important um, because it was triggering hearing helicopters and things like that for me. But as I saw certain clips, I didn't see the fear that sometimes I felt even when I was out there trying to make sure that my peers were okay, like trying to help folks when they're tear gassed or trying to make sure somebody has food because we've been out there for hours, um, trying to make sure folks are okay because they've fallen and they need bandage. And so it was just very hard for me to see that I didn't see the fear of death and the fear that I often felt when I was out there, especially back home uh, with fellow like protesting family and activists. And then it was also hard for me because I have friends who have been killed um, for being for, for protesting and, and fighting for the assassination of black bodies and black spirit and black futures. And so I, it was just hard because I couldn't even believe that nobody was even getting sh- the amount of care that people were getting either cuffed or talked to or allowed to walk um, out and walk away or allowed to walk out. I was standing on a sidewalk trying to protect babies behind me and telling police officers to like not scream and yell at them. And I got called everything but a child of God, spirit of universe to get out the damn way or to move and just everything And there was no care, but I saw folks being treated as gentle, even if they didn't have any teeth, even if they didn't bathe, even if they just came up showing however they wanted, um, they were still treated with care. And we were never, ever even thought of the fact of having care involved. And so that's what triggered a lot, like just to see the to recognize the humanization that they were allowed and the dehumanization that we experience black and brown folks, um, queer folks, um, trans folks who are out here doing the work. We are never humanized in the ways that was happening yesterday. And that's what was very triggering for me. Taylor says bathing the key to protest uh, access and safety. Winston, we'll give you the last word, bro. Um, You know, we've seen stuff like this in Michigan uh, where you are in the state Capitol. Now you see it in the nation's Capitol. Do you have any concern that there could be repercussions locally back in places like Michigan, like te- like Texas or like Florida where, or, or Pennsylvania, where some of these things are in question? <clears throat> um, let's be clear. Uh, you don't see any smoke coming to the city of Detroit uh, <laughs> with this kind of stuff. It's, it's bordered on the out on the outskirts in suburban surrounding cities. You know, it bubbles, obviously, on a national level at our state capital. But. Nobody's coming across eight mile with gas and smoke for, uh, you know, the radical side of things as much as they talk. uh, And we're talking yesterday, particularly about doing those things. I don't think it's a legitimate concern for um, for those folks, uh, you know, who live in the city of Detroit and and operate out of a majority black space. 
uh, even still with, you know, with gentrification and, um, you know, a little bit more um, cohabitation that goes in the city now than when, than when I was growing up, um, you know, particularly. But um, I don't think that's a, a, a real concern for a lot of folks in this space. I, find, I do find it very interesting, as has been echoed already, you know, a lot of folks on my timeline were seemingly like in shock and awe of, you know, what was happening. I can't believe and I'm, I'm so this is unprecedented. And I'm like, like, have you guys been paying attention for the past like four years? Like, what are you talking about? Nothing about what, what occurred yesterday. You know, I think maybe for me was a little bit shocking because I was not shocked. Like it was like, like, as has been said, this is this train is never late. This was right on time for, um, you know, any kind of uh, alteration in power structure and, and transfers of power. Um, you know, when when the, a majority of folk who've been um, in the positions to make decisions and change things and do things, when those people are not in those positions any longer, uh, when their way is not had with ease, um, you know, then then often becomes what we saw yesterday. Now, it may not have been to the level of, of storming, you know, a, a federal building, but we definitely seen mobs and definitely seen our share of fires and um, and, and people with their their displeasure and folks' lives being lost um, as a result of those things. So, um, you know, nothing about what was what we saw yesterday to me was was shock or, or awe or out of character for this country um, when we've been in these positions previously. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, we don't always get treated as humane, um, as, as Taylor said, when we're in these predicaments. But, um, you know, what Oris, a derelict of duty, or said, uh, you know, that's, you know, they were not, they didn't prepare themselves to, to protect the people who are supposed to be, um, you know, protecting our rights and, um, and and doing what's best for this country. Those people were not put in position to be taken care of the way they should have. Um, as a result of that, some people's, you know, lives were, you know, in da- put in danger unnecessarily because folks were like, oh, well, you know, they're not going to really, what's really going to happen. But, you know, to KD's point, this is, this has all been documented. You can go on social media and find almost to the date and time of a lot of the things that we've dealt with, including yesterday's events, um, that it's unfortunate that it took these things to come to the doorstep, literally, like it was said, um, for folks to be like, oh, wow, this is real. When in reality, for a lot of us, you know, to, to Taylor's point and, and Una and, and others who've been on the ground, we know this is real. We've already we've seen it. We lived it. Um, and, and for you guys to have to see it to happen to, um, you know, on a national scale at the doorstep of a federal building for it to make sense is unfortunate. And I think to me is also indicative of this country and historically what we've dealt with in general. It's tough, man. And, you know, usually this this show and this space is dedicated to covering HBC specific issues. But there, there are moments in time and in history where you got to step outside of even our box that we enjoy um, and that we take a lot of pleasure in working to improve. So this is one of those. So just glad to dedicate you know, this space and this time to that and letting people decompress and and really get it out there. Thank you again. And once again, this is Dodgers at the Dark, Sirius XM 142 HBC Radio, the pride of the Howard University Radio Network. We're going to continue on um, with our live recording, our first broadcast of the year and first broadcast on the Clubhouse app. I uh, want to uh, thank all the brothers and sisters in the audience. Uh, encourage you in the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to be inviting folks up to, to ask questions or to comment. Uh, and again, this will be also live on the air uh, when it's aired on Sirius XM. But we want to get into our next topic which is the McKenzie Scott uh, funding to HBCUs. Now, uh, in case you've missed it, HBCUs have come across uh, more than $500 million in gifts from McKenzie Scott, a philanthropist, the ex-wife of Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. A lot of these gifts unsolicited, unrestricted, totally up to the spending authority of the president uh, to, to improve their schools. And usually uh, these schools have, have received these funds uh, ranging from about $5 million to $50 million dollars. Uh, because of some uh, level of innovation and performance and stability and leadership. But what is interesting, and I think that has not been discussed a lot about these gifts, is I think that it redefines um, the way that we think about HBC philanthropy, period. And what I mean by that is now that you have a school that has received a big gift unsolicited from somebody who's not a graduate, somebody who's not a, a typical HBCU donor, what does it mean for the HBCU donors who are regularly breaking off 15, 20, 25 thousand dollars? But in exchange for those gifts, they have a certain level of access to leadership. They got a certain level of privileges on campus. They got a certain level of benefits and athletic tickets and uh, presence at galas and 
things being named after him. Do you think that the Mackenzie Scott gifts have put HBCUs in a realm where folks who are giving significantly less could or should expect less benefit or less privileges for being donors? And I will kick that off with, let's see, who am I going to pick on? Or so you're the money man. Uh, do you think that donors to HBCU should get different treatment or less preferential treatment now that some of these schools are in the money uh, in, in the high million dollar levels to the point that, you know, five or six figures may not be enough to be the, top, you know, the, 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 the king of the campus anymore? So let's also remember that every school didn't get this donation. So schools that didn't need to stay in that lane and continue <laughs> to give them uh, them gala tickets to the man who dropped five grand a year. Because um, you still need that $5,000. So I think that's part of it. Um, as everyone knows, I went to two HBCUs. One of them did get some money. The other did not. Um, I think we all know why that school did not get money. Um, <laughs> and I uh, I think that, so for, speaking from Morgan, for instance, Morgan got um, $40 million. Um, I, I, I think they still should, you know, should continue to, to be nice to their alumni who give less. Um, <laughs> because I think that it, it, sets a, it sets a bad example um, for the rest, of your, um, the rest of your alumni if you're not treating people correctly. Um, and I think also another really important, really, really important thing is that there really isn't a large amount of alumni who are giving five, six figure gifts regularly. We may have some who are giving those type of gifts, you know, uh, once a lifetime. Um, and, and that has its own, um, its own kind of issues where if it's only once a lifetime, you know, how, what, what effect does it really have? But I think it's important to, to also remember that we operate in a space where we need $10,000 every once in a while. For instance, Willie Lanier is an NFL Hall of Famer who went to Morgan. He gives about between $25,000 and $50,000 a year to the business school almost every year. He has an endowed um, professorship at the business school, a bunch of stuff. Are we not going to highlight Willie Lanier anymore because they got $40 million from Mackenzie Scott one time? But do I don't you, think but, so. Not to cut you off, but do you think that that's a different level because he's a pro football Hall of Famer? So it's not just about the money with him, but it's about the brand that comes with his giving, if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? But, like, but I, would, I, would, I would only argue that most um, current students have no idea who Willie Lanier was. I mean, he retired before most people's parents were born. So... Mm -hmm. I, th I think that I think that there's it goes both ways. I just think that in general, these gifts should be used to transform our campuses in ways that they need to. But it shouldn't change the way in which we treat alumni who give five and six figure gifts because we may never get these type of gifts again. Like this may be a once in a lifetime, 40, 50, 60 million dollar gift. And if you start to treat yourself like you've come up. Like you're the Jeffersons now, and oh, now we getting forty million dollar gifts. You know, you may ostracize people who were given fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, and now you've lost that revenue stream, which could be worth two hundred, three hundred, four thousand dollars over a lifetime. And you don't want to dry those type of things up because, again, there may not be another Mackenzie Scott, um, and that may this may be it. This may be the one time she drops this money off at these individual schools, and they have to make it work. So it shouldn't change the culture of giving at a school. I don't believe. Uh, that can cause some some issues long term. Do you think that, Laurel, that people should aspire for higher gifts? So let's take A&T, for example. Uh, of course, everybody can't give millions of dollars. Everybody can't be a Willie D's or somebody like that. Right. But you can you can stretch. Maybe a, a, if you if you can give 50, it's it's possible. It's possible that somebody can give 75. And so I wonder if you if you look at institutions that are saying, yeah, you can still get football tickets. You can still get gala tickets, but we got to have a different conversation about naming that auditorium after you. Do you agree with that? I mean, I agree. I mean, I also think anyone giving shouldn't be hinged on them getting a building named after them. I mean, now granted, I'm biased. I do think that GCB on a t's campus should be named after me because I spend an inordinate amount of time there, but that's neither here nor there. I think it's also the motivation. Why are you giving? Are you giving just because you want your name attached to something? 
Are you giving because you want to establish a clock tower on campus? No shade, all shade. Or are you giving what you have? Because I know I just got, um, I got like tons of literature from a and and last month alone, and it even said, like, you know, we'll take $30. And so I think, you know, especially if you're, especially if marketing to younger alumni who are not, you know, as, as established and whose pockets may not be as deep as people who graduated in 1963, I think that school should put the onus on saying, giving, give what you can, expand on what can be donated because you don't just have to donate money. Um, and kind of just expand the definition of what is supporting your school. And it's not, it doesn't just rest with financial. I don't think that they should, you know, classify and categorize the gifts that they do get. I think the onus on the school should be use what you use, what you've been given and use it for the benefit of students and the institution. Eric, do you think that the, the, the campus should have some say over how the school strategically views these kind of gifts, right? Because I think if you left it up to students, for example, or you left it up to alumni, you get a totally different story about what kind of gift has what kind of impact or what kind of thing, you know, shifts the trajectory of how a campus is viewed. Obviously, we're not stacking up to $20 million gifts, but do you think that the constituents to say, yeah, you know what, that person has been faithfully giving $10,000 for, you know, for four years, $40,000 overall, give them a name on a building. Or should it be something that's up to strictly the board, the foundation office, the, you know, the development office, the president in tandem saying, no, this is this is kind of the standard we want to establish for philanthropy. Well, that makes it weird, right? Because. At the end of the day. I hate to say this, but we know it should be like a joint effort where everybody can have to have their own you know, perspective or whatnot, but it's not going to flow beyond the executive office. We, we just know that's going to be the case. And, you know, ultimately, the, the biggest thing about this, this whole thing is like nobody has the, the, the space to get brand new. You said on this this very show before, like you got schools like, and this is what's one example. But Morehouse costs, what, five million a, a month to operate? Yeah, like if that's the case, then like y'all need to like incentivize get normal like regular everyday people who are giving the money that they actually earn, incentivize them at the end of the day giving their money. Um, y'all got that that got that big old gift and that's great. But when it comes to like naming and who should name, I mean, listen, if it was up to me, would RJ Reynolds have a building on the campus of Winston Salem State? No. But he does. Why? Because he's given a certain amount of money over the, over the years that he's had a relationship or whatever you want to call it with my alma mater. So, I mean, I think everybody should, I think everybody should have some type of input. And by everybody, I mean students, yes. Alumni who are giving alumni should also have a, should have a role. People who are active within the alumni association should have a role as well as the stakeholders and the employees and, and the staff and executive and board of trustee members. So I think it should be collaborative, but we know it won't be. Taylor, what do you think about the, the idea, especially post George Floyd, that you've had some campuses get five, 10, $15 million gifts back to back to back to back in like a month's time. Does that influence the way that you look at alumni gifts? Because now there seems to be a culture and who knows how long it's going to last that big companies, you know, rich individuals um, are willing to put up that kind of cash in the name of rec racial reconciliation. So does that however long this period is going to be, do you think that that's worth changing the scope of philanthropy at HBCUs? So are we asking, like, should HBCUs capitalize off of racial injustice and like collect reparations from folks i mean like, they are whether we call it that or not they they are um i mean i feel like we've always been a part of um the things that are happening especially amongst black folks in society um figuring out ways to uh bring in more support and um taking on you know what is happening in the times and so even when we talk about you know how folks will say this is why black education matters. And so I think it 
it's I don't necessarily see this as something new. I think um, folks are pushing even more because what I've what I am seeing is that especially HBCU alums who are occupying um, corporate spaces um, are pushing for corporate numbers. I think this is also just following um, the times that we're in and where folks are trying to push blackness on a larger scale, um, especially when we look across media, when we look across um, television, when we look across um, the rebirth and like um, black fashion and, and moving into black entrepreneurship. And so I think it's, it's something that funders um, and those who work in development offices are aware of and, you know, are talking about ways in which, how can we um, maneuver this in receiving funds and in those ways. But I'm also someone that believes in, you know, ensuring that your development and your funding is your portfolio is diverse. And so um, we've seen it before. Um, I think you've written about it just in regards of from an admission standpoint, how when the height of racial unrest happens, how, um, you know, uh, students applying to HBCUs um, increase certain years. But what happens afterwards? What happens when the wave goes down? So I am someone that is always thinking about um, the ways we are ensuring that we are having diverse funding opportunities if we are creating these um, corporate relationships, if we are creating these political um, opportunities, um, if you are a state institution, like what is the longevity of this? Make sure and this is not a one and done. Um, what is the plan behind it? And so those are my thoughts on it. I don't think it's not necessarily something new. I think when things happen and when they're buzzing in society, um, institutions in general, and also HBCUs, um, we figure out ways in which to make it work for us and how to uplift us. But I want us to not always just follow trends, but how do you create those tr trends to be sustainable for your institution um, so we're not just constantly chasing them? Winston, I'm going to round out this end with you, bro, because you work for a nonprofit that raises money um, specifically to support college access for students in metropolitan Detroit. So do you guys have, from that perspective, just from a fundraising perspective, a new view of who gives to you and what kind of relationship, what kind of communications you have with those kind of donors because the number is up a little bit? Yeah, no, the, the, the I think the biggest thing is the number is up. You know, that's all the things we're talking about. You know, folks who have not, um, reached out to us previously or been aware of, keenly aware of us <clears throat> because of what's going on are now more keenly aware and are reaching out to us. So so that is that has been the conversation for us about the ways to properly engage them, um, continue to keep them engaged in what we're doing. Um, it's interesting because it also, I think, comes to the level of responsibility that we're talking about as far as, you know, what their expectation is as far as being involved with our program in the ways that, um, you know, them donating money what type of access that allows them um, and, and what say they have over um, over the donations that they make um, in regards to us being able to do what we do. So um, I think a lot of what we try to do on the front end, too, as well, is just give the options. Like if you go to our, you know, to our web page, um, to Midnight Golf, web, Midnight Golf's web page, um, you can see that there's a lot of different ways for you to donate um, and ways that you can allocate for that money to go. I think um, kind of trying to direct a little bit. Um, in the way of saying, you know, we can use this money for these things, as opposed to sometimes when when someone, I mean, I, I know that the our HBCUs maybe didn't have that, now maybe they did not have the option to be able to do that, um, but but fortunately, you know, McKinsey was was open to just kind of make the donation and allow the schools to make the decisions that make sense. But I think that's also a thing, you know, for 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 our institutions and when they get those money and how things are allocated or um, earmarked um, for specific areas. Um, so for us, um, I think. On the front end, we've been fortunate to kind of have a lot of, you know, steering in the way of um, where those where those funds might go and how they can be beneficial um, for our young people. And because we've been we've had to do so much before that was a, a reality for us, before folks were really engaged in and wanting to donate in that way. So we've had time to think about um, and kind of build it, build it slowly and gradually. Coming down to the last section, live recording on the Clubhouse, Clubhouse app, Digest at the Dark Sea, section 142. I want to round out, I want to invite brothers and sisters in the audience now, raise your hand, come up to the stage. Our last section is going to be talking about expectations for HBCUs in 2021. And I'm going to bridge this a little bit uh, with my expectation uh, for this upcoming year. I think some presidents are going to get fired. Uh, you know, in the, in, around the last show of the year, I talked about there are going to be a couple presidents retiring and there are going to be some presidents that's going to get fired. Why? Because 
even though there's a lot of money coming in, um, with the way that that COVID is shaping enrollment, with the way that these donations are coming in, there may be some headbutting about how should we spend the money? Should we address debt? Should we try to pay faculty? Should we try to embolden scholarships? It's going to be a lot of opportunities for folks not to get along about how to handle good and bad on our campuses. And that kind of tension where it is going to be new for us because so much is going to be on the line, not for 2021, uh, but probably in the not for this upcoming spring, but in the fall. What's going to happen when there ain't no more CARES money? What's going to happen when, it, you know, enrollment isn't bouncing back like we thought it would, even though a vaccine is out? What is going to be our role in terms of opening a campus even when a vaccine is available? Do we make it mandatory? What kind, how does that conflict with state rules? So I think a lot of leadership is going to be in a, in a significant period of tension. Tiffany, I'll kick it off with you. What are your expectations for HBCUs without mentioning the word Howard University? How did I know that you were going to start with me? Because you are petty, okay? Um, my concerns, since I work at an HBCU that is not my alma mater, um, my concerns are around um, campus living and campus life. Um, a lot of last semester, we were in uncharted, um, in an uncharted territory and experience trying to just catch students and keep them engaged um, and having students on campus. And watching how all of that played out, I don't want to see it play out like that again. You can't say, oh, we've never been here before because we're still in the same place, essentially. So I do want to see um, better behavior on the part of students. Um, and if students don't behave better, I would like to see some action. Um, but more than that, I don't necessarily want to see students even be put in a predicament where they just want to live their best lives and they're going to they gonna do it regardless because it's, it's still it's still dangerous out here. Like we just found out that coronavirus has, has mutated and that it's here. Right. And so for me, I, I think about students, but I also think about my colleagues and my peers who are still traveling like there is not a global pandemic. And so we're all back to work, essentially, or we'll be back to work by the end of this week. And I'm like, but y'all have been traveling. And so, yeah, they'll say or have said, get tested before you come back to work, wear your mask and everything. But we knew this before and people still did what they wanted to do. So that's what I don't want to see. I want to see better. And I think better is staying at home and getting this, this two, this two, this two case semi. That's what I want. Um, more than it's a two case semi. Let's welcome Ty, brother. How you doing, man? Thanks for tapping in. Hey y'all, how are you guys doing? Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, sir. We hear you. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Great. great. Just wanted to make sure. So I am a relatively recent graduate of Hampton University. I graduated. Okay, come on, Hampton. Yes, home by the sea. We got yeah. live audience in the studio, I'm also, though. <laughs> I'm also a proud member of Ogre Phi Ogre 16. So if any of y'all are ogres, definitely. Uh, I'm quintessence, but it's okay. Honest, it's okay. but Hampton love all the way. All of the course, way. of course, definitely. So um, just to, you know, continue on the topic, something that I feel HBCUs could do a lot better with. I heard social life was mentioned. That's definitely a big thing. I really feel like HBCUs at one point in time were really just known for being these spaces where like the black creatives were, where there were these black revolutionaries. And I really feel like we need to get back to that because for all my people that went to Hampton, you know, we always say Hampton is Hampton, you know, but there are people doing that out there, but I feel like if it's, you know, supported and encouraged, especially in the current political climate, I really feel like not only with that secure kind of sort of the place of an HBCU in society, but it could really breed a new generation of leaders who have that experience of being supported by their institution, which then goes back to the conversation you guys were having earlier about donating. 
that may also encourage people to donate more, especially if they feel, you know, not only did their professors have their back, but their school supported them. That could really be a really good turning point for historically black colleges and universities. Excellent. Excellent point, bro. Um, despite Hampton taking over the room, I, 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 do you think that 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 happens? Despite with a new with a new president <laughs> at Hampton, and I, and I and I wonder, do you think that there's going to be a culture change at HBCUs? Like, are do you do you feel like we're going to become more even more centered on black liberation and the black experience? We've seen a number of HBCUs create centers for uh, you know social justice, for example. Um, not that HBCUs were ever ignoring social justice, but we're seeing specific research uh, constructs around that idea. Um, several campuses, public and private. Do you think? Do you see HBCUs going into? I don't. I don't want to say a militant posture, but do you see them becoming more aggressively uh, outspoken in a lot of ways about pro-blackness, emancipation, uh, black empowerment? And actually, let's go to. Um, Let's go to Shania. How you doing? Oh, good, brother Jerry. Was that a question for me? No, I actually I, that was actually for Shania. I, I actually hit the button. I'm sorry. Go ahead, sister. You wanted to answer that oh, question? Sorry. Oh yes. Hi, Shania. I'm also an alum of Hampton University. Oh my god. <laughs> hey. What is happening here? Heard you? Heard you? Why just, don't I have a boo one of my little babies too? Yeah. <laughs> just just a little tidbit. But no, to answer your question. I feel like for us to be more organized, it has to be more than just the students and the professors. Because if you look at Hampton University, yes, Harvey is retiring in, what, two years? But his already his his successor is already pre-groomed, pre-cloned. Like, that is to take over his same journey, his same path. For that to be a full revolution, it has to come from the president, the VP, the student affairs, like... Mrs. T, when I was there, Miss T was the saving grace. But then I think Dr. Emmon, she 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 was like the one that was not there for the students. So it has to be more of an organization far, far better than just the students and professors, because everyone has to be on the same accord. That's the whole thing. It's an internal thing. And I don't know what that needs to look like or how does that need to change. But I think that is the 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 first step. Given the number of Hamptonians in the room right now, are y'all predicting that Hampton will be number one on the U.S. News and World Report rankings? We don't. We don't go by U.S. News <laughs> Report rankings. Like all of this we is made up. up. We this not is none, of them, none of them. Ranks, not, none of them Not none of them ranked. <laughs> yeah, we, of, we don't. We don't play with U.S. News and Report. Okay, this is all of this is made up. We've already discussed how U.S. News and Report is built off of white supremacist ideals and all those other things. Okay, like, oh, big T. What do you think the posture is going to be for public HBCUs? Because under Trump, uh, and, and we know that that a lot of uh, a lot of our HBCUs are in uh, Republican leaning or outright beat red states, right? Some of them, you know, were able to get you know some some favorable budgets this time. They weren't usually hit upside the head like they normally are. Do you think that that's going to continue under a Biden Harris administration? Katie, we can go to you, bro. Um, because they're, 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 under Trump, there was a compulsion to say support HBCUs because we saw it coming from the top. Do you think that that's going to happen now that there's, there's less pressure for that, for that to occur? Well, if I'm to listen to John Ossoff, that's one of his main focuses. And since we sent uh, John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock to represent Democrats in the Senate, giving them the majority, especially being that Raphael Warnock is not only a BGLO member, but also a graduate of Morehouse, if I'm not mistaken. I would certainly hope so, since we sent so many new HBCU graduates to the executive branch in particular in Congress that, yeah, I think that we'll get some love, a little more love than we're used to, especially on the public side. Um, but it's also up to us to, uh, again, execute that we'll do right by our students and the community and with the government's money. And it's also up to us to advocate for ourselves and show that we are capable of um, producing leaders in America. But I, even with that, I think that just this on the sheer fact that black people brought this home and it was largely on the backs of HBCU alum that um, we're definitely going to get some love this time around in comparison to from Democrats in particular in comparison to other administrations. I just don't see a way around it because we'll be loud about it 
from now until Biden is done being president. And we'll hold the next Democratic nominee to that same um, to that same standard simply because we put them to the black people once again, save the world from itself in America from itself. And we want our reparations at this point. And I think we're in a position to, to demand them, to be honest. KD breaking bad because his mayor got an afro. I feel it. Um, <laughs> um, pull your mask up, Shorty. <laughs> pull your mask up, Shorty. That's what, that's what I said. <laughs> um, let me ask this last question. I already know Wait, the I answer. Go ahead. So are we going to see and or demand um, the same level of UNCF and TMCF engagement in terms of these fly-ins and I just from from my memory and I could be wrong um when Trump was elected there was all of this and maybe it's because it was Amarosa in the mix talking about what what she's been working on and doing but are we going to see our stakeholder organizations still hold this same pressure to Biden and uh Harris and, and other and designees to get the same amount, the, the baseline amount of things done and, and allocated to us. Like, are we going to see that? I think we will. I think you're going to see Biden and Harris meet with the HBCUs. I think they're going to do all the, the, the photo op quote unquote stuff real easy because that's the, that's the baseline stuff. I mean, Obama went to a commencement ceremony. Or two, I'm not talking three. about the photo op stuff, though. I'm no, talking but about that's what I'm saying. Like they they'll do the easy stuff, but the the question will be, how can you what what is the, what are the policy outcomes that you're going to be looking for? Because you know that the first thing they're going to say to everybody, not just education, but to everybody, okay, tighten your belt because we got to pay for this coronavirus stuff. So then, what do we say? Policy first need to hit them student loans. I'm not even going to hold you because it's thank you. Oh, okay. That's on who? That's on who? But let me step my toe in for a second. Let me People dip it have in always water. said that, you know, in this whole, aside from the coronavirus and we need to deal with the virus and vaccination, there was also a question of, oh, the, the National Fed is in a deficit. How are we going to reboost the economy? If you erase everybody in this country's student debt, I promise you, I'm not the dude on whatever channel that is on MSNBC with the dude with his sleeves rolled up and he yelling and he holding papers and stuff. I'm like him in that. My man, Mad Money, Jim Cramer. Yes. If you erase <laughs> everybody's student debt, and I'm not even talking about, oh, well, we'll just take 10000 10K not going to do nothing. If you take everybody's student debt, that alone will boost the economy so much, you ain't got to worry about giving out stimmies. And I think the issue is that they don't have the right people talking to them. And I think the other thing that may change in the next couple of years is that regardless, in government, it's already a changing of the guard. People that haven't already retired or resigned, um, they're leaving, even if Biden come in, because the real issue in the government is going to be who's going to be willing to go into public service and be the cleanup crew. I got my brother Bert in the studio with me here. Uh, he says, if y'all forgive student loans, he's storming the Capitol solo uh, because he successfully paid his off last year. <laughs> okay, that's cool. That's fine. No. Okay. And that is no. 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 We got that be a well wisher, brother. Be a well wisher. Look, I'm but, just okay. I pay mine off too, but everybody needs to eat. Everybody needs to support everybody this needs. bail fund. Start the oh, yeah. Right just remind, yeah, I'm about to say, just remind him, it ain't really that easy to get in. He ain't gonna handle Clarence. <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, look, I'm I don't know how to ask Elizabeth. <laughs> let me let me but ask like, this last question in the last few minutes. How many of y'all are gonna get the vaccine in the hopes that enough of us get it and we can have homecoming? Me. <laughs> I'm, Jerry, I'm, I'm always just, try to start some stuff. I, I, teach I got, I got to wait well. for a few more to get it, but I'm, I'm watching. I'm watching. <laughs> I mean, oh. I haven't left Moderna. my house. Una had the vaccine since before. November, uh, so that that she's been out <laughs> in the streets. I'm um, in Brooklyn. I'm I, I waiting to see somebody get the vaccine and be pregnant. <gasps> Why would you say that? Because he, I think he's gonna be pregnant. No, no, no. I'm so, okay. I, no, I'm saying because. I watched a show last year called Utopia. It kind of messed me up. All I'm saying is, is that I wanted to know that the that, that actually doesn't sterilize people. So I'm waiting to see 
and somebody oh, took gosh. the actual. You know, listen, some of us trying to out here family plan and all that. That's all I'm saying. Like that, that's that's my thought process. I, I respect I respect your your, I your space and place. I teach K twelve since saying. I got a baby on the way. I'm just going ahead and get the get the vaccine. It's a baby problem. See, look, I don't even have. I'm a husband. Kids. Line me I'm up husband. if that's the case. Ty said he doesn't have kids. He's trying to get the homecoming. I'm away. I'm away. Because <laughs> Ty, because homecoming is important, right? Yes, so it is. It's not happening and in 2021. I don't know okay, why. Sis, because but this can, is my biggest can thing. Dream, can she? Go dream on, baby. Dream, 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 dream virtually. Have you right. seen a dream deferred? Like, <laughs> this, <laughs> like <laughs> she done broke out the, the, the like literature. <laughs> okay. Because um, the big thing for me was I really wanted to go to this homecoming because this would have been my first homecoming on the yard, actually Aww. being a member of my Aww. group of my organization and for homecoming to have been canceled i was low-key kind of salty because i wanted to go back see my friends and i just wanted to have that full experience but homecoming got canceled because covid so hopefully things will be looking better by like april of 2021 yeah. i'm a little hopeful i'm a We're little not hopeful. even having graduations in april i was gonna say like are we are we seriously do we seriously think, we're gonna, we that, think that, that homecoming, homecoming is going to be 21 or are we looking at 22 22 at this point 22. probably 22 Listen, i would love for 21 I'll, be, I'll, I'll say it's happening to 21 by you have to be honest about the vaccine. even disbursement of vaccines. I like feel the bad folks. for Tito. And, and also, the thing about it, what state your HBCU is in, and then go with that. Yeah, yeah true, so. true, true, true. And the thing about it is, I'm going to be white people very come in contact with. honest. Just understand the human beings. At this point, there are a lot of people that are just willing to accept the risk because they're just people tired were willing of being to in the accept house. the risk in the beginning. Right, and so exactly. it's getting worse These are because facts. we've been in the house. For a year, so yeah. I don't think anybody's going to shy away from attempting to do homecoming in the fall, especially you know, if you're going to be outside. I think people will do unofficial, but I think this goes back to the yeah. conversation that we had earlier about the responsibility and the expectation of leadership. Like leadership can can say no official homecoming. Like we are not. There's no tailgating on this, and but we will tailgate at the choosing, Hardee's right across the street. People are choosing <laughs> to do so, <laughs> but like I'm not a big homecoming yeah, person because my school doesn't do it. But I promise you, if Morgan has a homecoming. I don't issue, know if that's gonna be the case. Go. <laughs> I don't. I don't even know if people will will even if administrators who make that decision will will respect that and really enforce it. Like we have people still talking about playing sports in the middle of a panty. I mean, like, they are playing sports. No, they are playing sports. 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 I mean, you right. realize that you all, the, all the all the all the deals. The Heisman just got one. I've been, I've been, I've been talking about. So, so I mean, like, sport. so like, if we're if we're making all these plans and creating fake bubbles to put our student athletes in, like, and, I, and, and see, making it before possible. Before she says something incriminating. Right um, <laughs> a homecoming no, bubble. No. It's gonna be a, a homecoming bubble. No, homecoming no, bubble. Job. Just, Jared, cut the tape. Around. Brothers and cut sisters, thank you so much. We have come to the end of our first live broadcast on the Clubhouse app and our first broadcast of 2021. Love y'all so much. Thank you so much for another tremendous show. Thank you, Ty, uh, Shania. Thank you for coming up to the stage. We will do this absolutely again no every problem, week good brother. Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. Again, this has been Digest After Dark. Peace.